<laughs> and look at that. I am so uh, behind on the schedule here, only by about two minutes more than my usual 45 after the hour, <laughs> that we already have one viewer, which is good because last time I only had one or two or three viewers, and now I'm up to almost 70. I don't know if you looked uh, on YouTube and Twitter. I think there's about 15 or so on Twitter and about 50-some on, on uh, YouTube. Ah! <laughs> Greetings and salutations. So, as I was saying, interestingly, uh, we only have one or three or five or ten people usually. And then, lo and behold, let me put this up for a sec. And uh, so, hey, Janet, nice to see you and talk with you again. I feel like that, uh, what's the guy's name? I like him on the radio. Uh, he was just on shoot. Hold on, I'm doing two or three things at once. Ah, yeah, here we go. On my recent YouTube from 12 days ago, I guess it was, this is where I was saying that I'm surprised that at some point more people show up. So let's see, view channel, here we go. Ah, showing my live one right now. That's funny. Live. But yeah, look at the one below right now. One watching. There's Janet. Here's the other one. 52 views. Before that, eight. And you keep going. Before that, 14, 10. Like I said, it's usually about 10 people. Uh, here's one where we had about 33. And so the good news is that these things stay on and then people can watch them down the road, I guess, if anybody hears about it. Oh, I wonder if Janet uh, got to hear... Uh, uh, Colonel Murray, Lieutenant Colonel Murray was on and he just stopped at about close to 7.30, which is why I got started a little bit later. But anyway, uh, tonight, as it says on the board here, we're in the angelic conflict. Let me grab all these things. Continuing in this text by R.B. Theme Jr. And continues with, and this is really good and interesting, the corporate witness, and this is in regards to marriage and then some. We can begin to really see how the biblical claims and facts are manifested because our situation right now, obviously uh, the signs of the times, we are living in what seems like a prophetic environment, but the truth be told, I guess, Life itself seems to be full of prophecy. <laughs> and where does prophecy happen? It happens live, here and now in the world. And I am always impressed with the fact that so many of the things that happen that are big time, uh, like situations with wars or uh, national leaders and the changes in, in a country... The things that go on always, they dovetail with everything that Bible doctrine has to offer in terms of understanding, let's call it God's law, you know, how law works. And so last week, I hope you had a great uh, week, uh, Thanksgiving week, as I put up here. No number 276 because uh, I decided to take that week off and it turned out really good. It worked out really well because a lot of things that I got to do during that week probably wouldn't have happened uh, had I been preparing uh, my usual Sunday, Monday for Monday night and Tuesday, Wednesday for, for the Wednesday night broadcasts, which reminds me also to mention that these broadcasts on Mondays and Wednesdays are being sunsetted. Uh, and it's sometime between now and the week of the 18th and 20th, Monday and Wednesday of December. 
And that's because I'm not sure yet my little contract, if you want to call it that, uh, with StreamYard is going to end and they're going to want me to re-up for another annual subscription and I've decided uh, to nix that so I can get a few other things done. But let me pull up this board, some uh, preliminaries for today, Monday the 27th. If you're kind of new here, I expect not to understand some or as much of this, but please stick with it. And also you can watch previous week's replays um, to understand more of what I do on these Monday and Wednesday night exegesis or exegetical broadcasts. And I have my second of three boards. This second one that I've been using, uh, and I had mentioned this earlier to Janet, we had a conversation about uh, California, among other things. And I mentioned I used to have this board with me on 3rd Street in Santa Monica, and uh, people would wonder, what the heck is this guy doing playing music on 3rd Street? And then what is this all about? Grace and the gospel are good news, like my alliteration. Religion is not good news. True or pure Christianity, and that goes for true or pure Judaism, um, is or are not a religion. Uh Christianity and Judaism in their true or pure original form. Uh, if you think Christianity is a religion, then hear me out. Why do I have these couple of preliminary boards? The first one, just giving you the date and saying, hey, guess what? This is slightly different than you're probably used to seeing elsewhere on the internet. Why? Because we're dealing with the subject, as it says up here, exegesis. What is that? Well, um, it comes from two Greek words, a preposition where we get uh, ek, and in Latin it's actually ex, and then, you know, so ek in Greek, and then hegeomai, and that's how, kind of hard to see how hegeomai becomes Jesus, as in exegesis. Actually, the egesis, that would be part of the hegeomai, and it's funny because any Greek word that has a H rough breather ha, sound like hegeomai. See, in Greek, it actually starts with an eta, a long E, and they put this little squiggle on top of it, and it makes you ha, breathe out like an H. So instead of egeomai or egeomai, eta, Alpha, Beta, Delta, I'm sorry, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Eta, um, and so on, the Greek alphabet. The Eta is a long E. Regular E in Greek is called an Epsilon. And so this happened to have a long E and with a rough breather over it. And so it's the verb, hey, get oh my. And uh, I could go on and on with the Greek grammar that the my ending makes it it's either a, it's funny because when you have my at the end, uh, it makes it look like it's passive, but if it's a deponent verb, like hey, get oh my, then it's active. So active in meaning, um, but passive in form, blah, blah, blah. I know you're saying it's Greek to me. And that's the problem with Greek grammar is most people don't know it. And therefore, uh, it, it's even worse than if you knew it. <laughs> That's to say that it's pretty bad when you know it. Um, anyway, hegeomai and ex to pull out from is what we get out of that word. And so exegesis is when you're pulling out from the Bible what's there. Some people have the nasty disposition of putting stuff into the Bible that's not there. And that would be instead of ek and ex, it would be ice in Greek, which is to put into. You know what? Just to show you, to be a little bit obnoxious at the introduction, meaning if you don't like Greek grammar, then you're probably going to say, this is obnoxious. <clears throat> I'm 
just to show you these Greek prepositions, I'm going to take this ultra famous Greek grammar, a manual grammar of the Greek New Testament by Dana and Manti. So this isn't even a, a basic Greek text for learning Greek. Rather, it is a text for learning syntax. So it does say a manual grammar, so it's a grammar of Greek. But when you look, um, no, I don't want to bore you with all those details. All right, let's just go to the chart. I want you to see the prepositions. And where do I go for that? I've got a, ah, here we go. I, I've got to get to the right page because I got all these wonderful charts in this book. And why am I having a hard time finding the... It's, I know, I'll tell you why I'm having a hard time because I haven't been in this book in a while. I thought it was around page 129. Where is my preposition chart? How? Ah. Page 113. All right. Let me go back a few pages more where I can show you this important Greek grammar. You may think it's not that big a deal, but it is, as it says, significant. All right, so we have prepositions starting on page 96, okay? And the preposition is a word used as an aid in the expression of substantive or nouns relations. All right, so you put it in front of a noun or even a verb and I'm going to show you the two that we want to deal with here ice is the one that means going into and it's in Greek there but the e-i-s it looks a lot like English e-i-s and by the way the accent above it is a smooth not rough breather but if you look on the back side there going out it's hard to read that, but that is E-K, ek. Now, the easy way to show you a little bit about all this is I'm gonna show you the, let me get, let me get the uh, entry. Here is ice, and you can see it much better, better, and you can see this little funny squiggle above the eye. That is what we call a smooth breather. Um, it, I will show it to you this way. When you write it, you go from above a letter, you do a semicircle from the left down and back to the left. And it would be read as an ice instead of an H sound above it. Look what it says, root meanings, within or in. Okay, and eisegesis, you put into the Bible what is not there. In composition, into, put it into the Bible. Like here, it says, ice ale thane, to go into. So, um, fancy schmancy stuff in the Greek grammar department. Now, remember I told you it does, it's not eisegesis, it's exegesis. So, you go to the EK um, word, and let's go to ek. There's N as in in, epi, and why am I having a problem finding ek? Because it's ecky, like icky. All right, I'm having a problem to find ek. What happened? How come? Oh, is it because there's N, ice, ek? Okay. The, and in Latin, it would be, instead of E-K, it would be E-X. Root meanings, out of or from within. In composition, out of. So we pull it out of the Bible. Okay, we pull it from within the Bible. We take it out. And look how it says uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Um, and it gives you, it says, Furnishes a striking example of the perfective use and then blah, blah, blah in Greek. And so I won't bother you with those details. But look at the meaning, root meaning, 
out. We're pulling it out of the Bible, right? I was saying it's what taking out what's there from the Bible and bringing it out. Okay, and that is where we get exegesis, so to speak. Part of that has Greek and Latin prefix. And, you know, just for fun, I could get uh, from a regular dictionary, but <clears throat> let me also show you this free book that you can order. See, you get all of these things at no charge if you get in touch with RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries, and this is their catalog of everything they have to offer. I imagine this book is not in it because this catalog is older, but it's called the Themes Bible Doctrine Dictionary. Um, they charge nothing. Look at the paragraph above. It says, uh, last couple of lines, um, publications and recordings of his classes on MP3 CD and video recordings of his classes on DVD are available without charge or obligation. That includes all the books. And there's the contact info for anybody who wants to screenshot it or write it down. I'll hold it up for a minute. And notice it's RB Theme, T-H-I-E-M-E. -E. RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. There's a P.O. box, but check it out. And they're open um, like tomorrow, for example, Tuesday. 713-621-3740. Um, you can call them. There's the www.rbtheme, T-H-I-E-M-E dot org, where you can order stuff too. No charge ever for anything from this ministry. Well, in this book, I wonder if the term exegesis is in here because I haven't looked that word up. And there it is. It Just check this out. For, for the RB theme uh, Bible Doctrine Dictionary, for... Exegesis, it just says see ice. Why? Because that's dealing with three words. I is isagogics, C is categories, and E is exegesis. And that I can tell you because of ice teaching. So I'll go there. We're having an experiment here. I haven't even started the... Uh, we're still in the uh, preliminaries, but I got carried away. All right, let's look at ice. Here's iconoclastic arrogance, imminency of the rapture, incarnation, intercalation of the church, isagogics. Well, I got to go back to I-C-E. Oh, no wonder I goofed it up. All right. Is it on the first page? Oh, man. Not only was it the first entry and on the first page, but... Look, it takes up a whole column. So I'm going to, it says, A, acronym for isagogics, categories, and exegesis. Three analytical tools that form one overall method for interpreting scripture and teaching doctrinal conclusions. B, a threefold biblical hermeneutic, that means for interpretation, that allows, from the Greek word hermeneia means to interpret, that allows those with the gift of pastor teacher, i.e. yours truly, to accurately study and teach God's word, 2 Timothy 2.15. And it goes on from there, okay? And then it shows, look, isagogics, categories, and there's our term exegesis. Grammatical, etymological, syntactical, and contextual analysis of Scripture from the original Hebrew, Old Testament, Aramaic, Old Testament, and Greek, New Testament. Every verse must be correctly translated in order for the verse and its passage to be accurately interpreted. For further reference, uh, Daniel chapters 1 through 6, lessons 102, uh, number 27 and 30. So there's a book that the colonel wrote called Daniel. It started with six books, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Then it turned into Daniel chapters 1 through 3, 
and 4 through 6. Then it came out with another edition that's Daniel 1 through 6. And those of you who have been with me for a while have seen those books because I've pulled them out on occasion uh, to show and explain the history of how it went from individual chapters to two books for three chapters each to finally one volume with all six chapters. And what he's saying is, if you go to uh, to that book, you can get more information. And also in uh, Daniel, so a series uh, that are available, uh, all these different series, one of them, uh, the Daniel series, in uh, it says Daniel 102, uh, lesson number 27 and lesson 30. So this is technical. And well, what can I say? The Bible is a very technical book. So what I wanted you to see was when you, uh, when you see this chart, this diagram of prepositions, and let me find that again. Let's see, what? yeah, here we go. It's called the diagram of the directive and local functions of prepositions. Okay, technical, technical, technical. All right, and it writes the Greek words in Greek. That's why the, the alphabet letters are different. Like peri, the circle, it's got peri, that's perimeter. N, in the middle of the circle, that's in. Uh, we talked about ice, that's going into the preposition. If you go for the other side, it's going out and it's E-K, ek. And so exegesis, you pull out what's in the Bible, N, in. You, it's in there. You pull it out and you uh, figure it out. And that's called ek plus hegeomai. And that means you're pulling out of the scriptures what's there. Not eisegesis, putting into the scriptures what isn't there, which uh, a lot of people do. And that's how we get religion. People really add to the Bible. No, it means this. It says this in the Bible. No, it doesn't say that. Actually, if you read it in an English Bible, it may say that in English, but if you read it in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever, um, you then have to do this ice business of isagogics, historical interpretation, I should say historical context, um, categories comparing scripture with scripture, and e exegesis, which is the syntactic and grammatical breakdown and using all these different things to come up with an interpretation, a hermeneutic from the word to interpret in Greek, hermeneia. Sorry, it's technical, right? Now, this tonight will be technical too, but it's going to be really interesting because I'm going to tell you right now, there are four divine institutions, and I know I still haven't finished the preliminaries, but just so if you've never heard of them, because some people haven't, the first one is free will. The second one is marriage. The third one is family. And the fourth one is nationalism. The four divine institutions. So, we're going to get into that. Now, before we do that, I showed you two boards. The one about, if you're new here, you know, uh, hang in there. It's definitely obnoxious and hectic. But there's a payoff. The second board. Well, remember I said grace and the gospel are good news. My little alliteration with G's. And how religion is not good news. And true or pure uh, Christianity or true or pure Judaism is not religion. Why? Because religion is man-made. Christianity and Judaism is from God. Hate to say that that way because uh, I know a lot of people, if they watch this, uh, maybe from the Muslim world, maybe from the, you know, whatever, even certain sects of Judaism, uh, maybe from all the other religions, you know, the Baha'is, uh, the people in uh, all the, the Buddhists in, in Asia, etc., etc., etc. What are they thinking when I say grace and the gospel are good news and religion is not good news? Well, one, the, the least they can do is not like me. 
And that would be the first thing that happens. And then it gets worse from there for me. But on the other hand, what they think doesn't affect me. So when I say worse for me, it's from their vantage point. I'm having a nice day, you know, regardless. So continuing now with the third of three boards, <coughs> excuse me, the final of our preliminaries. I bring this up at the beginning of every class or session, whatever you want to call this get together, because people, if they've not seen a chart that looks like this, and believe me, there are lots of them, uh, and they're close, they're very similar to what you see here. They can be presented slightly differently. But they say, what is this thing? And I say, well, uh, the cross symbolizes the cross of Christ. It's our symbol of salvation. And why is that? Well, it's because in the eternal life conference in eternity past, God set it up. Uh, there was a meeting, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit about how everything would go. And it, it would take a very long time to explain all of that. <laughs> so if I just give you the rundown real quick, God promised that there would be eventually this event called the crucifixion, the cross of Christ. And you'd say, well, what was that for? It was to atone, in other words, to rectify, cross out, get rid of the problem of sin, atonement for sin, payment for sin. And you had to satisfy God. That's called propitiation in theology. And it means you you satisfy him, and let's call it in a way of a satisfactory payment for sin. And the wages of sin, I think it's uh, Romans 6.23, it's 3.23 or 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And so uh, we're all sinners, and that's explained over here, because we all have an old sin nature, because we all inherited at birth Adam's original sin. And so I explain this in a detailed way over a period of time. I won't do it all the details tonight. But when you believe in Christ, the fact that he went to the cross and died for the sins of the world, you get placed in union with Christ or union with the Messiah, which means the anointed one, forever and ever and ever. You can never get out of this circle. It's a little bit of an oval, but pardon the artistic... Uh, uh, license there. Um, you're placed into this circle forever and ever and ever, but you're also placed into this bottom circle, the filling of the Holy Spirit. But this one, it should be a broken line because you can get out of it through sin and personal sin. All you have to do is commit a sin and you may not even know you committed it because you may not know it was a sin. Um, and when you do that, you're out of this bottom circle and then you have this problem, the old sin nature that resides in every cell of the human body, then is your boss and you are controlled by your old sin nature just as you were from birth until you became a believer. And when you are a believer who's gotten out of the filling of the Holy Spirit, out of this bottom circle through sin um, and are controlled by your old sin nature, you can fix that by naming your sin, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we name, claim, cite, admit, or acknowledge, really it'll use one word, like if we confess, but that's not the best word in English. In fact, there's even a word to describe how not good it is. The word is anachronism. And it's anachronistic um, to say that you confess your sin to God. Why? You can confess to a judge in a courtroom or a jury or to a, a partner, as we will see tonight, the corporate witness. Um, but you can't confess to God because he already knows. So that word used to work three, 400 years ago, but it has changed its meaning. And so now we can't use that word. It just doesn't fit in the sentence if we confess our sins, because you can't confess to God. So 
We use the word if we name our sin or claim or cite or admit or acknowledge our sin. He is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin and all unrighteousness. So our sin, those are known sins, all unrighteousness, that includes even sins that we committed and we didn't know were a sin. Crazy world. So um, when we do that as a believer, we get back into this bottom circle where we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So this little circular idea is known in some certain theological uh, persuasions and sects as rebound. You rebound, you name your sin and rebound and move on. So, but you can only do this when you're a believer. So the first thing is faith in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Acts 16, 31. Uh, by the way, uh, if Janet is watching, I, I was telling you about Third Street and how I used to do all this crazy stuff. This is some of the conversation I used to have uh, on Third Street and some of the people uh, would believe it or not believe it or ask questions about it or argue about it. And it was fun getting involved in this thing called apologetics. So anybody who wants to look up the word apologetic, it doesn't mean you're apologizing and feel apologistic or something, apologetical. No, apologetics is defending, and it means in this case, defending the faith. So you are able to defend your position, and that's not an apology as in I'm sorry, that's an apologetic. So fun having all these technical words, and that's why you go to school to learn them, uh, especially if you go to a seminary, you learn these theological terms. They're in our dictionaries, so you can look them up. But uh, where do you learn about all this stuff? It would be either in church or at a seminary. So what we do at the beginning, and it's been longer than a beginning here, it's been a long beginning, of our get-togethers is I start out with a moment of silent prayer so that we can prepare ourselves that is, if you have never placed your faith in Christ, and as I mentioned, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's getting to be Christmas time. Um, well, oh yeah, that's right. I needed to pull out my Christmas tree. I haven't done that yet. I have a little uh, lit up Christmas tree thing. I'll have that for Wednesday. My bad. Um, when you believe in Christ, then... These two main things, along with 38 others, a total of 40 things happen. Um, <clears throat> when you place your faith in Christ, you get placed into union with Christ. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're indwelt by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And all of this stuff applies to you. So if you've never placed your faith in Christ, we're going to take a moment now for silent prayer where you can do so and become a member of RFG, the Royal Family of God. Rho, phi, gamma, using the Greek alphabet letters, speaking of Greek. And um, when you become a believer, like I said, you're going to be a believer forever, even if you reject the faith and all the rest. Why? Because God took your name, put it in his pocket, proverbially, and he is a God of honor and keeps his word, the word of God, capital W, and will never... Uh, pull you back out of the pocket and uh, cast you out into the nether world and what we call the abyss of hell and Gehenna and all that kind of stuff. Um, no, God doesn't do that. He keeps his promise. So when you become saved, it's a once saved, always saved. Now, for those of us who are saved, we may need to rebound and so we take this moment now for silent prayer to do that. So without further ado, let us pray. We thank you once again, Heavenly Father, for your grace, for this opportunity to grow in grace. And also, uh, we thank you at this time. It's getting to be that time we had Thanksgiving. We're going to have Christmas. Uh, New Year's and so on and so forth. And even that, a little bit after that, it gets to be that resurrection day, also known as Easter time. So we're coming into this season of festivities and commemorations, holidays, holy days to remember 
all of these things that you have done, these promises that you have made and kept. And at a time like this, we can take this moment and thank you and be mindful of the fact that in the greatest sense possible, you love us. One of the 10 characteristics that we call the essence box of God, uh, you are love and you love us and it is a, uh, a perfect love, capital P and capital L for love. And so we thank you at this time, both for your love and your integrity, the fact that you've made it possible for us to have a relationship with you by faith alone in Christ alone. And we thank you that the things we're going to study tonight also have to do with love, some of it being that kind of love, your love from you, impersonal love and personal love, and as well, the symbol that love is in the institution of marriage. So thank you for all these things and much more. And we ask them as always, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. And so voila, uh, we are moving along and getting started tonight with, as it says in our text, the angelic conflict, the corporate witness. And we can begin to really see how the Bible the biblical claims and facts are manifested. Now, there, these things are always there, but people rarely see them or know them. And that's really the problem, is people don't see or know this stuff. And so tonight, where we are in our text, we're continuing on uh, page 71 with the corporate witness. And this is going to get interesting. So I hope that you're able to hang in there with me and deal with this stuff. I want to mention a couple of things, and I'm going to mention them again at the end. Uh, the first thing is about prayer. We have prayer at the end of our meetings, and I pull up my prayer board. And there are several uh, prayer requests that I have for tonight. And then um, I wanted to mention these issues, what we're talking about, this angelic conflict, the spiritual war. We have it going on. It's a certain way for unbelievers. And it's something altogether different, a different and another way with believers and especially what the problem is right now that we have, oh, I just see we had an amen. <laughs> so yes, uh, thank you, Janet. Amen and amen. Um, the, we have a, a real problem is that just like everybody is different in age and in knowledge from being a baby to being the oldest person to their last, last breath or being somebody that is that old and still is like a baby because they don't know anything. Ah, and I just put a note here to say in the spiritual war between how it is for unbelievers and their life in the world or believers. And how about this? Believers with little or no Bible doctrine. That's a whole category of believers from you're a believer and you know nothing about God and the Bible and anything theological to being a spiritually mature believer, somebody that just like anybody else that went from kindergarten to high school and graduates and goes to college maybe or not, or graduate school or not, you know, we grow. Well, we also grow spiritually. And unfortunately, we're living, especially in this client nation to God in our country, the United States of America, um, we are supposed to grow and say graduate, you want to call it high school or college or whatever. That's supposed to happen. And unfortunately, we have a nation where for the most part, spiritually, that didn't happen. So 
uh, you want to call them spiritual nincompoops? That would be one way to term it. Uh, I can say it with humor or a, a certain amount of seriousness. <laughs> um, well, d here's the point. To be a corporate witness, um, see it says here, in the church age, there is a special case of a witness for the prosecution achieving tactical victory as a corporate witness. And you may say, I don't understand. What are you talking about? What is all this? And I'm going to say, well, it's going to take me a minute to explain it. Actually, it's going to take the rest of this evening to get into it, most of the rest of the evening. And so what I'm trying to, and what this book is trying to get across and kind of whatever you want to call that, uh, explain in great detail is, as I mentioned, the four divine institutions. The first one is free will. And it's a part of our setup to have freedom. The second volitional thing in this, meaning that get, having a choice, you know, to th be, think and be free, think freely. In the second area, there is something called the second divine institution, marriage. Well, what's that about? You take two free wills and decide to get together. And that has a lot of ramifications, including staying together. That's something. And then uh, how you go about that. And then even an implication of a third divine institution, which is the outcropping of the second one, where you start out with two from the first one, getting together and getting married. And then all of a sudden a third thing happens, they have a family. And so divine institution number one, free will. Number two, marriage. Number three, family. And pretty soon as that begins to grow, you end up with a fourth thing because the family grows, <coughs> the community grows, eventually a whole area grows, pretty soon a lot of areas grow, pretty soon you have like seven or eight billion people all over the place. Now, when I say pretty soon, it took a while, but you can see the four divine institutions free will, marriage, family, nationalism. It's all perfectly logical and in, in the order even. Everything, it grew. And so we're going to see tonight how this thing turns into something that becomes a real problem both in our personal lives and experience, but also going all the way into the idea of where we are as a planet and as a people and in time and in God's plan and so on and so forth. And so let's start. Anybody who has the book, uh, page 71, and there it is, The Corporate Witness, and it's about victory in the angelic conflict from the text, The Angelic Conflict. So let's start and I will read starting at bottom of page 71. Here we go. The corporate witness. In the church age, there is a special case of a witness for the prosecution. That would be God being the, the prosecution. And uh, the witness, that would be you. That would be me. So that's us, mankind. We have the opportunity to be a witness for the prosecution, achieving tactical victory as a corporate witness. Well, was that a mouthful? Tactical victory as a corporate witness. Some people may even say, uh, what's that? Even more significant, hopefully it'll explain it to some extent for you here, even more significant than the testimony of the individual believer, this corporate witness is Christian marriage. Now you'll note 
there is a footnote. Footnote 43, which says, Marriage was the first organization, the first corporation in history. Derived from the Latin corpus, meaning body or a corporation, is an association of individuals created by law, existing as an entity, and therefore any group of persons united in one body. So that's interesting. And here's what it continues to say. In this case, this is the union of one born again or regenerated man and one born again or regenerated woman who demonstrate a positive response to God's marital authority structure while simultaneously executing the unique spiritual life of the church age. So living in the age that we're in, this is a unique spiritual life that we get to experience as well as a life. And remember, everybody who's not a believer, they're living, they're experiencing life, but they don't... Uh, you know, understand all of the spiritual ramifications because they're not a believer. And greetings to Trevor. I see he says Trevor's here. <coughs> and also somebody else was here earlier. Uh, at least I, I saw there were like three viewers at one point. So anyway, welcome. And Janet is joining us. Uh, Janet, this is Trevor. Trevor, this is Janet. And uh, we continue. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, this Christian marriage is the union of one man and one woman, two believers, who demonstrate a positive response to God's marital authority structure while simultaneously executing the unique spiritual life of the church age. Christian marriage is now the corporate opportunity to succeed where Adam and the woman failed. Ha! Ah, see, because marriage wasn't quite... <coughs> I mean, nobody actually had a marriage ceremony, except God performed it, if you want to call it that, with Adam and the woman, Ha'isha. That's why it's not called Adam and Eve here. It says, you'll notice at the bottom of this paragraph, Adam and the woman uh, failed. And so they say, what do you mean the woman? You mean Eve? I said, well, she wasn't Eve in the beginning. She was Ha'isha, the woman. And then she became Eve, the mother of all living meaning people, because obviously she wasn't the mother of, well, any other living thing besides homo sapiens. All right, continuing. With the inception of the church, God elevated Christian marriage above the divine institution of marriage and made it part of resolving the angelic conflict. So for that, we have footnote 44. And down here, you can see I marked the spot, not with an X, but with an arrow. The divine institution of marriage began with Adam and, again, Ha'isha, the woman, and will forever define, uh, define matrimony as the union of one man and one woman. As a biblical institution, marriage is sanctioned for both believers and unbelievers, regardless of the dispensation. Um, and then it says, Christian marriage composed of a man and a woman who are both believers in Jesus Christ is only available in the church age. Now, I'm not going to belabor the fact, but you just heard a couple of terms. The church age and uh, dispensation. Here is a chart on the dispensations of time from eternity to eternity. So when you start here, it's eternity past. And then there is all the stuff that happens, original creation, and then chaos. And then the world gets set up, tohu vabohu, in the beginning of Genesis, which is so that man can exist on the earth. <laughs> so that's the beginning from eternity past to when we get to eternity again, the new heaven and new earth. 
Okay, and we are living in this area here called the present church age and the age of grace. And so the reason I'm bringing up this chart is because it mentioned dispensations and the church age that we're living in and that Christian marriage, in case people didn't know it, is only in this church age period. So that's interesting too, in terms of this thing dealing with interpretation, hermeneutics, from the Greek word hermeneia, uh, to interpret. And it deals also with, uh, could talk about eschatology, the fact that in the future, so remember, this has all the stuff that happened in the past, and then it goes on and on and on until the present, and then on and on all the way to the new heaven and new earth and the great white throne judgment and fire from heaven and then uh, the lake of fire and all the unsaved and uh, all of the uh, fallen angels and everybody ends up over there. Okay, so that is a big overall view of everything that's going on. So... Um, it says, as a biblical institution, marriage is sanctioned for both believers and unbelievers. See, so it is a biblical institution, even if you're an unbeliever. It's still in the Bible. Okay, regardless of the dispensation or period in history. And it says it's sanctioned for both believers and unbelievers. Um, Christian marriage composed of a man and a woman who are both believers in Jesus Christ is only available in this present age, the church age, <coughs> that you saw in blue here, the blue circle there. So I didn't know that at one point. I said, oh, I thought marriage would even go on beyond the church age, like in the tribulation and in the millennium. But it'll be different because it won't be this weird thing uh, that we could call this... Uh, uh, a witness because, for example, in the millennium, Christ is ruling on the earth, right? And while he is here, you don't need Christian marriage to symbolize the deity of Christ in terms of the relationship between man and God that God has accepted us as saved because of our faith in Christ, our union, like it said in that top circle, union with or union in Christ. Um, at that point, Christ is there and everybody sees him. So there doesn't need to be this corporate witness. And that's why it makes sense that it's only during the church age. So um, the divine institution began with a perfect couple in perfect environment but even perfection could not protect them from the advances of Satan. Now, this is where it gets interesting and ugly. For marriage to bring forth a tandem victory of husband and wife in spiritual warfare, there had to be far greater provisions, mandates, and empowerment. <coughs> Excuse me. The revelation of church age doctrine so the doctrine during the church period here, and the operational spiritual life added this new dimension to marriage. Even under the worst conditions, Christian marriage can succeed and produce unprecedented contentment, stability, and testimony to both the unbelieving world and observing angels. That's pretty interesting. Only in the church age do believers have the opportunity to jointly participate in such distinct and magnificent evidence against God's antagonist. And now we have footnote 45, which says, A believer married to an unbeliever, check this out in case you're wondering, a believer married to an unbeliever cannot be part of this corporate witness. Believers are warned against being, and here in quotes, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that's from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 
and it's from the King James Version. So that means that it may sound slightly different in newer, uh, more modern, contemporary translations, which is, again, why you got to have good exegesis. Okay, so we covered that footnote. In, dis in distinguishing Christian marriage from the divine institution, God assigned to husband and wife the same relationship that exists between Christ and the church. The husband's leadership in marriage is now analogous to Christ's rule of the church. His love for his wife must reflect Christ's love and sacrifice for the church. Now check this number out. 51% of responsibility in marriage lies with the husband. People may want to argue about that. <laughs> Beyond initiating an environment of love, tranquility, happiness, strength, loyalty, and stability in the marriage, the Christian husband must provide the spiritual tenor and lead the spiritual advance. The greater the position of leadership, the greater the sacrifice. See, this has something to do, uh, as the days are long, with marriage. And here are the references from Ephesians 5, 23, and then verses 25, 26, and 27. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body, <coughs> dot, dot, dot. Now we get to verse 25, 6, and 7. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up as a substitutionary sacrifice for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless." And here's some more. The Christian wife's subordination to her husband parallels the subjection of the church to Christ. She responds to him in obedience as to the Lord, quote, as is fitting in the Lord, Colossians 3.18. Out of that response comes the highest form of love, dot, 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 dash. What do you think that is, the highest form of love? respect, like uh, Rodney Dangerfield used to say, I can't get no respect. Okay, with her relationship with the Lord as first priority, the wife willingly submits to her husband rather than seeking to undermine his authority, Genesis 3.16b, where we have a fancy word that's only used twice. It's used in uh, in. Genesis 3, 16b, and in Genesis 4, 7. And it has to do with the, the improper use of, and we could call it, of usurping authority. But that's another subject. But it does say, uh, let me see. Let me get this to the right spot. Where is it? Okay. Let me get to the beginning of the sentence again. With her relationship with the Lord as first priority, the wife willingly submits to her husband rather than seeking to undermine his authority, Genesis 3, 16b. She is the most beautiful of all creatures when she responds to her husband from the doctrine in her soul. And here we have Ephesians 5 and a couple of good verses, 22. 24 and 33b and it goes like this wives subordinate in other words in italics be subject there it is be subject subordinate to your own husbands as to the lord but as the church is subject to christ so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Excuse me, I have the beginnings from allergy season 
It's not coming out yet, but I can tell it's coming because my nose will let me know. Histamine production. Oh, that reminds me. I should take a quick intermission to get my... Dehist, uh, a natural antihistamine. Sounds like I'm making a commercial. They do that so much now on all those goofy uh, podcasts, of which I resemble one. And let me take a short moment here to quickly. Um, I'm gonna quickly get a drink. I'll be right back. Hang on, I gotta take these two antihistamines. So. Uh, an intermission, a pause for the cause. I will be right back. Ah, Pellegrino and lime. I can't see the bubbles. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, time for some antihistamines. Cheers. I can figure that stuff out practically like clockwork when it's coming. So we shall see how the coming weeks go. I guess I'm allergic to junipers. And those are the ones that hit about this time of year or in the next couple of months. Okay, so back to where we were. Um, I mentioned that, uh, oh yeah, this is really good here. Let's, let's read Ephesians 5, 22, 24, and 33b. Wives, be subject, subordinate to your own husbands as to the Lord, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So uh, that respect issue is so important. Um, and I, I, I'll just do a short diatribe here, an intercalation or insertion. The idea that so many people should know that if a wife respects her husband, as the scripture says here, then it's easy for her to love him. So if the husband wants to know why he, uh, like Rodney Dangerfield says, can't get no respect, uh, it's because uh, if he doesn't do what he is supposed to do, um, then he's not going to get what she is supposed to give. <laughs> There's one way of putting it, uh, trying to be not really, but politically correct. Okay. The mutual responsibility of both spouses is forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. How about that? Um, there's no virtue when the past failures of a spouse are remembered. Forgiveness is always a function of grace. Each spouse bears the other's failures by relying on his own relationship with God and confidence in his, capital H, plan, God's plan, centered in Christ. When two believers unite in matrimony and advance to spiritual maturity together, God is glorified and the angels cheer. Consequently, Christian marriage stands as an intense battleground, not for war between uh, the, the married couple and the schemes of Satan. I'm sorry, not for war, I skipped the line, between the husband and wife, but for the ongoing combat between the married couple and the schemes of Satan. Boy, I better say that sentence again. Don't want to get in the wrong conflict. Uh, especially in these matters with marriage and war and 
and the schemes of Satan. So I repeat, consequently, Christian marriage stands as an intense battleground, not for war between husband and wife, but for the ongoing combat between the married couple and the schemes of Satan. His subtle and overt offenses are abundant, trivializing adultery and divorce, promoting communal living, disregarding the divine institution of one man and one woman in marriage, reversing male and female roles, feminism, homosexuality, lesbianism. I have a comment to make here shortly. All of these perversions are effective weapons against the union of man and woman. In addition to these attacks, Satan steps up his invasion of Christian marriage with distractions and pressures aimed at deterring the spiritual life of each spouse. For as goes the spiritual life, so goes the marriage. Okay, comment. Uh, no extra charge, by the way. Um, it's interesting what I just read. If it, if it were any more controversial, it'd get me bumped off of YouTube and uh, Twitter or X. Because at this moment in time, like it says, his subtle and overt offenses are abundant, trivializing adultery and divorce, promoting communal living, disregarding the divine institution of one man and one woman in marriage, reversing male and female roles, and then the last three, feminism, homosexuality, and lesbianism. So, um, the comment I, I need to add here is this text, and it's the latest edition, it's a 2022, yeah, 2022 second impression, was <coughs> first published, first edition, in 2012. Now, the colonel had passed away already in 2009. Okay, this is Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., and see, 1918 to 2009. So <clears throat> this book was put out three years after he passed away. But what's so interesting, it says this book is edited from the lectures and unpublished notes of R.B. Theme Jr. And what's neat is he has about 11,000 hours of all these sermons. And you can imagine how many books could yet be written out of those 11,000 hours. It's really great. All right, so uh, I'll read a little bit further here. Let's see, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm going to read a little bit more. Um, so how exactly do the born-again husband and wife defend against the enemy's concentrated assault? How do they surmount the internal challenges of marriage as well as the outside influences of the devil's world? They advance together to spiritual maturity while remaining within their divinely ordained roles. They embrace the elevated opportunity and utilize the enhanced ability to exercise spiritual leadership and authority orientation. The husband initiates that leadership, and the wife responds. With Bible doctrine in the mix, man and woman enjoy a coalescence of souls, a unique and intimate interplay, distinctly influencing each other as they move toward the high ground together. Husband and wife mutually support each other in spiritual growth, problem solving, and rearing children in the ways of the Lord. This tandem spiritual advance the Christian husband and wife in synchronized application of Bible doctrine defeat, uh, defeats Satan's seductions and wins a supreme tactical victory. This is the ultimate in Christian service, an unbeatable team, an impenetrable and victorious witness for the prosecution in the angelic conflict. So that's what tonight's issue 
the corporate witness uh, accomplishes when applied, let's call it, uh, successfully. And it notice it takes, let's put it this way, an individual. And then when there's one individual and two of them separately, individually, they get together and become one unit, a cohesive unit representing uh, the body of Christ, i.e. the church and the relationship between the church and her husband, Christ. So the marriage analogy of Christ and the church is now in Christian marriage, the husband and the wife. It makes a lot of sense. And everything that was said here is a part of building it. So an edification complex of the souls as opposed to of the soul of one, you know, building up one's soul. Here, it's building up two souls together. The two souls become as one. And then in, a, in the way that the church and Christ are one, the husband and wife are one. And you have this interesting corporate witness, which becomes uh, a witness for the prosecution, meaning God, God the Father, prosecuting Satan and the fallen angels and ultimately all the unbelievers. So there's a lot there. Now, next week, we'll continue in the completion of the church age. If you think that isn't going to be interesting, um, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet, as uh, the expression and song goes. So tonight, um, I wanted obviously to uh, make that emphasis of the corporate uh, witness and the idea that in the angelic conflict, not only are we going through it and are we in it, but we have an opportunity even as individuals, to be, as uh, Joe Griffin calls it, uh, good soldiers for Christ. So that's one thing that's a wonderful, you know, uh, what could I call that? A wonderful testimony. But another one that's interesting is the corporate witness in the angelic conflict. And we have that opportunity in droves at this point because as you may have noticed, things are getting really ridiculous. And so on that note, I want to mention a couple of things here. Uh, we obviously need to look at a couple of issues. Um, I had a text from Laura and maybe she's joined us. Are you there, Laura? <laughs> um, there is a particular thing that happened, a, uh, what can we call it, a travesty. Ah, here it is. And it is the ridiculous shooting of a guy named Hans Schmidt. And there's his wife, uh, Zulia, and uh, they were in the streets, in fact, at the corner of 51st Avenue and Peoria, uh, and this is in the uh, Phoenix area, and they were out there, guess what, witnessing, witnessing for Christ, and it says here he was shot in the head while street preaching. So uh, they very much need our prayers. Uh, I didn't check to see if he's still with us. Oh, I like what she said, by the way. Um, her comment as, a, as a, a lovely wife here in this example of a corporate witness. What does she say? Thank you for your prayers, believing God has the final say. And then look how nice she says to her husband, I love you so much, babe. So um, here's a 
great illustration of a Christian couple corporate witness. And as her husband lay dying in a hospital, if he's still alive even, she thanks the Lord for him and says, I'm leaving it in your hands that it's all in your hands. She doesn't even say that you'll heal him or not. That's a pretty great Christian testimony. And if I understand it correctly, that he's the pastor of a particular church down there, um, I think that is a great, one of the greatest illustrations of a husband and wife team where the wife in this kind of dire straits calls on the Lord and says, by the way, I trust you whatever the results are because we were doing the right thing and we know that honors you and we put it back, I put it back in your hands. That's what I mentioned early on tonight that there is a spiritual war between the unbelievers in the world with the spiritual war and then the spiritual war with the believers where the believers are in the spiritual war and so many of them have little or no Bible doctrine. Uh, in this particular case, this couple, Hans and Zulia, I keep wanting to say Yulia, but I guess it's with a Z. Um, they seem to be a real good testimony. And so I thank Laura for uh, bringing them, uh, this couple, to my attention the other day because I'm not paying much attention to news and local news, although I, I catch certain things and pay special attention to certain things. That one uh, would have gone right past me, and it's only about 100 miles away from me down in the Phoenix area. So... Um, the other thing is I know Trevor, we've been praying that a bunch of good things happen, uh, in reference to your business and situations with the real estate stuff and, uh, working, uh, it it's, looks really good. Meaning with your dad and, and that, uh, one particular sale that might be pending. So I bring up the prayer board to say that at the end of the night, um, I always want to come back to the importance of prayer, that prayer is something that we do personally and corporately and in, in so many different ways. But the first, let's call it prerequisite or requirement of prayer is being in fellowship. The first thing is rebound if necessary. And we went over rebound in the beginning tonight uh, a little bit, um, and then the second thing you get to do is give thanks to God for the relationship that you have and that I have with him and with each other, all of us. And then the third area, and this is like what we just covered, uh, looking at this, what seems like a really nice couple, a wonderful uh, couple in Phoenix area. He's out there giving the gospel and somebody shoots him in the back of the head. What's that all about? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Because think of the anger that went into shooting someone you don't know because they're giving the gospel on the street. Amazing. And so our opportunity in prayer is to intercede for everybody, including that couple and, and everybody else that, as you can see in this list, you know, whether it's a pastor, church, missions, missionaries, government, uh, law enforcement, military, illnesses, uh, pastors at large in their congregation, students. So there are a lot of categories there. And so we're including that couple, and I'm repeating for uh, Trevor uh, that we know that he likes some prayer in regard to his uh, work and that God will direct him and prosper him accordingly. And then finally, we have the fourth thing, which is petition. What does that mean? Well, anytime you want to pray to God, 
you can tell him whatever it is that's on your mind and whatever you're wondering about. Now, most people, when they start to pray, if that's what they're trying to do, they start right there. Oh, Lord, I've got this terrible problem. Or, oh, Lord, I have this question. What should I do? Blah, 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 blah. What I just told you in, on this chart is, no, don't do that. That's not how you pray. You can, but that's just not how you do it. There is an order. There is a book called prayer. You can get it at no charge. How? Well, you get in touch with RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries and you tell them that you would like this book called Prayer. Let me find it right here. It's on the previous page. L-M-N-O-P. There. This book right here, Prayer. Prayer is a great weapon of the spiritual life. Prayer allows believers instant access to the throne room of God and direct communication with Him. By following the biblical rules for effective prayer, and that's kind of what we were talking about, believers can confidently express gratitude to the Father, intercede on behalf of others, and petition for personal needs. See, that's everything we were talking about. God answers prayer in fantastic ways, but always so that his will and plan might be fulfilled. So, uh, see, that's why I bring up that board, that chart that shows how we, we get in fellowship first, make sure we're in fellowship so we can thank God and then intercede for others and then answer, have him uh, help us to answer any questions that we have about what to do next. So, um, on that note, unless there are any questions from the chat room, uh, we're ready to call it a night and continue, as I say, we'll, well, first of all, continue on Wednesday with the promises of the Messiah, which I am sort of still dealing with <laughs> because we've got so much other stuff. You know, I am going, as I mentioned also in the beginning, to be sunsetting these Monday and Wednesday night get-togethers. Um, but we still have opportunities to continue to either be involved with RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries, which will give you more than the amount of time you have left on this earth, more stuff to do that you'll than you'll ever get to. And... Um, and the other thing is, if you want to be involved with a church, and even though it's an internet kind of thing where you can watch, um, Bobby, so RB Theme Junior, I mean, I'm sorry, RB Theme the Third, the son of Bob Theme, um, here's uh, Bobby, is the pastor in Houston. And you can continue. This is a major theme, and he was. Uh, a, let's see, does it mention here? Distinguished career in U.S. Army, serving as infantry officer, airborne ranger, and tactical and strategical intelligence officer. So um, he followed in his father's footsteps and then literally <laughs> ended up being the pastor at uh, Baraka Church. So uh, was voted in after his father, they, you know, candidated a few people, but the congregation said, no, we want Bobby. So the father uh, retired uh, only because he was becoming uh, deficient in the memory department, also known as uh, Alzheimer's. And so he basically, he didn't really retire. They uh, let him step down. And then Bobby is now the pastor for the past 20 years or so. And so check it out. You can... Catch Bobby at, uh, well, here, let me pop this on. Let me get this uh, to the right page. Do, 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 there we go. Streaming lessons at Baraka Church. He is right now, Bobby has been teaching practical divine wisdom. And... This one was from the 16th. Let me keep going forward. 
uh, where's the next one? And then the next one. Almost to the end here. Here is from Sunday, yesterday, November 26th. So point is you can get online and as it says up on top here, baraka.church. And like I said, I may be sunsetting these Monday and Wednesday night broadcasts, but you have more uh, left behind, like that movie, uh, for your spiritual edification than I could ever do or that you'll ever live long enough to check out. There's just too much. There's almost 100 books. There's over 11,000 hours of audio and video, and that's just from RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. Then you got another 20 years worth of stuff at Baraka Church. So how about that for good news? And on that, I guess we will close. And so thank you for being here tonight. And I hope to see you on Wednesday. We will continue. I never know what I'm going to do now because I don't know if I'm even going to be there. If I'm not there, this is how you can get a hold of me because if I don't have your phone number, we can't talk. If I don't have your email, we can't even go back and forth. But uh, anyway, I plan on being here for about the next, I guess it's about three some weeks, three or four weeks. And meanwhile, you have yourself a good evening and thank you for being here. I uh, render my salutations there and wish you a good night and hopefully see you on Wednesday. So thanks again and have a good rest of your evening. Okay, good night.